So hello everybody. I'm uh, going to present you a video game on uh, synthetic biology. Just to present myself, I'm Raphael Gouget. Um, I'm a computer science engineer. I've worked on uh, commercial games and then on scientific games. And I am do doing a PhD on uh, learning with uh, video games. I come from the Center for Research and Interdisciplinary, T, like Jesse. Uh, we, we are based in Paris. Uh, on the tower on the left, uh, to Montparnasse Tower. Uh, I invite you to go to the website creeparis.org and uh, especially on the game lab page. It's the lab in which uh, Jesse and I are working. Uh, we are working on any sort of game uh, that can be interested for uh, education and digital technologies. So our center is specialized in education, digital technologies and life sciences. That's why it makes sense for me to work on a video game on biology, educational video game on synthetic biology. I won't make the same presentation as last year's, so if you want to know uh, more about the game itself and uh, uh, the thought process to, to create such a game, I invite you to, to, to watch the video that is uh, on last year's website. The main idea is that video games are uh, based on prob prob problem solving and therefore learning. And, uh, whoa, okay, it's not what I wanted to have. <laughs> uh, so you have complex games like this. Uh, it was too fast, too bad for you. And next one is a bit more easy. So you see that there is a whole range of games and a whole, whole range of learning. And in more words, uh, this is something that I have taken from a research paper. Uh, it, it focuses on precise aspects, precise features that video games can uh, enhance. So motivation, interest, retention, collaboration, and problem solving. This presentation is going to be a bit academic, but I'll try not to, uh, to bore you to death. <laughs> so yeah, demo time, woo! It will be the only uh, <laughs> case to balance the uh, academic thing. <laughs> All right, so. As you saw when I uh, prepare my stuff, I'm going to play in uh, 640 times uh, 480, and it will be awesome. And I think it will be it will resize anyways. Yeah, because <laughs> because why why would I choose? Ah, yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> so as you can see, it's exactly the ratio I wanted. <laughs> and <laughs> but the the version on the internet that you can play right now is the old one that that was presented last year. And this version is the next one that will be online in next month. So um, what we've changed since last year is uh, the, the tutorial aspect. Last year's version was kind of uh, discover by yourself and understand by yourself. Now it's, uh, it's more juicy. You see bubbles and it's cool. And the algae are waving like this. It's, it's way more entertaining. There's still a nice scenario that we have not touched. And we have uh, also introduced some uh, cutscenes because here I don't understand. I cannot move. What the hell? I'm a bacterium and I cannot swim. What's going on? And then there's another bacterium that comes and does uh, what is called a horizontal transfer of genes. So it gives me a gene for me to be able to move. So you see, I introduced a story, but at the same time, I'm introducing a very interesting notion of genetics. And that's Organisms can exchange DNA. Uh, and then it's, it's a tutorial like you can see in very annoying games like Zynga games, etc. But it's very necessary just for the beginning. It's, it stops after a few minutes. So it shows me where I have to click and what I should do and what's going on. So I will go very quick. If you want to understand, uh, in a few weeks, go to the website and, uh, and do it yourself. So it shows me where are my genetic sequences that are active right now. So I have one which is uh, making my bacterium move. I very quickly show the interface. It's very complex. Just stay here. Don't leave the room. And uh, it shows me what is, is relevant here. It shows me with what I, I can interact. Because the test I've done with the previous version showed that um, everybody rushed to play but did not understand what was going. So now it's very guided. I see what I have to click so that I can move. Yay. So now I'm a... Uh, Bacterium is a flagellum, and I can move like this. All right. So later on in the game, I won't show you everything. You, you'll see by yourself. Uh, there are other notions that are uh, shown to you. For instance, it shows you that cells can divide. 
So here I divide and it gives me a checkpoint. If I die, I will go back here. So if I euthanize myself, poof, then I reappear here. Okay, no demo effect, thank God. Then you, have, you can find other DNA sequences and I will stop the demo here. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. Okay, nice frog. <laughs> uh, there was a plan B, which was a uh, trailer, but it has worked somehow, so you won't see it. Uh, so what you've seen in these few minutes of, of uh, demo is that uh, we've tried to incorporate <coughs> real game features to make it entertaining. Uh, so it's a real game with challenges. Uh, there is stealth learning. The idea that you're not taught something is something that you absorb from the game. You know that there is horizontal transfer. You know that, that there is cell duplication. But never have I showed you uh, a book with, okay, this is horizontal transfer, this is cell division. Then there is also stealth assessment. It means that when you're playing, you're being evaluated, but you don't know that. There is no QCM, I mean, uh, multiple uh, choice question. So you're, you don't feel like you're being judged. So you play and, oh, everything's cool, etc. Uh, you've seen tutorials, you've seen some feedbacks. There is on-demand science. It means that you're not, you don't have to read a full chapter of, uh, of science, and you can skip most tutorials anyways. There's as little text as possible, and so on. So, what am I doing here? Why am I at them with my educational video game? It's because it's an open source game. Uh, the C Sharp code is on GitHub, but hey, it's Unity, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, the um, genetic sequences come from um, an online registry, which is the BioBricks Foundation. So it's open registry. It's also uh, open source analytics. That Jesse Himmelstein here, which, uh, sorry, you're eating, mm -hmm. finish, uh, who developed yeah, the open source analytics. And there's open data too. So if you want to see how the game is being used, you can uh, go on uh, redmetrics.io, see the hero coli version you want, and see how people play. So you can do your own science on it. And you can control that I don't extract uh, personal data too. And where does it all come from? Why, why are we doing this? Um, well, Jesse and I have written an article and published it uh, on uh, open analytics. And um, it comes from a, a, whole, a whole process. First, there were games. I don't have to present them to you. I mean, uh, there are games and educational games. Uh, there is a whole range, like games in which you learn nothing, like the, the mobile game I, I showed in the first slide, and games in which you learn almost everything there is to know, like uh, Kerbal Space Program on top. Then there, were, there was proprietary user tracking. So it's when um, you incorporate a program that extracts uh, data from, from user, user actions. And for instance, if you see, uh, if you search for an uh, application in science, there was a corrupted blood outbreak in World of Warcraft. Maybe you've heard of it, but there was a huge epidemic and uh, lots of people died. And for players, it was kind of fun, but kind of annoying for the people. But for scientists, it was pure gold because it was the first instance in which they could simulate what people do during an epidemic. But the thing is that the user analytics were not developed to study this. So lots of data have been lost, actually, and that's very sad. There is a paper that I cite here that talks about this problem. I've put that just to troll you. I know that it's not World of Warcraft. It was just to, uh, to annoy gamers. <laughs> uh, it's also because in, uh, in Warcraft 3, uh, there is also user analytics. Uh, there was, because I think it's not playable anymore. In, uh, Battle.net, uh, and you could see what people were doing when they were playing. There were stats on uh, which heroes were being played. So that's also interesting. It's also user tracking. And then after games and after uh, proprietary user tracking, there was crowdsourcing for science. I hope you've heard uh, about uh, Foldit, the game that's presented here. Who hasn't? Who has never heard ab about Foldit? OK, lots of people. Cool. Uh, so it's a game in which you take a protein and you try to find the more stable uh, position. So protein is a chain of amino acids and amino acids are kind of magnets, you know. And they attract each other at some points and they repulse each other at, at others. So you, you imagine a string of magnets and if you, you, uh, you just uh, shake it and it will, it will reach um, 
a stable position. And in the game, we try to do that. It's too complex to, to solve using a computer because it's a chain of 300 amino acids with tons of magnets everywhere, so it's impossible to, to solve. The combinatorial possibilities are exponential. So what you want to do is to uh, start from here, try to tweak it, and uh, find the stable position, which is kind of compact, as you can see. So people try to uh, rotate parts of it. Etc. So this kind of games was uh, created by the University of Washington in like 2008 to solve a problem about proteins on HIV or something. And uh, scientists were stuck on this. They had been stuck for 10 years. They couldn't manage to understand what was the shape of the protein. But gamers in a few weeks solved the problem just using this. So the results were published in the, in the paper I showed here. So it's, it's, a, it's in a very serious journal, Nature, right? But you can see here players. So uh, it's the first time that science and video games were brought together. And from that, it was demonstrated that games can be useful for science. So n next step, I want to do that with Hero Collide, but I don't have time to explain, maybe with questions. <laughs> so then, next step, what is it? It's to use user tracking for science. It's a kind of a, a logic, uh, logic step. So that's what Hirokola is doing. We want to study how people learn. So we use a game, we use user tracking, and you, we use that for science. All right. So inside the game, we try to put some tracking, uh, tracking system. And from that, we can uh, plot how players are moving through the game. And we can plot what events happen where in the game. So if I see that people are stuck here, I will understand that you know, they, they die a lot here. Black is, is death here. Um, if they are stuck here, it means that maybe the notion that I try to introduce is too complex. So I have to work on that. And I know that it's hard for people to learn this notion. But of course, I can do way more science. I mean, here yeah, I can do, uh, you see I have logs on the top left. I can do graphs. I can do uh, pie charts. I can do everything. It's awesome. <laughs> so this is, <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's a pub chain. Yeah. So I can, I can do all of that and uh, study what people understand, what they don't understand using uh, yeah, these kind of, of, of forms. Um, yeah, it's like uh, Andrea was presenting just before, pre-test, post-test, etc. So what's the next step? Uh, next step, okay, it's going to be a bit more meta, so please, uh, please don't collapse. Uh, it <laughs> now we try to do crowdsourcing on user data for science, all right? So now we take user data that were uh, gathered on top left here on uh, what people were doing on the, on the game. And we give it to people for them to analyze, all right? So it's not just scientists. It can be, uh, in this case, it's uh, therapeutic games. So um, we ask patients what they think about the user data we've gathered on themselves, OK? So they can say, well, uh, uh, the doctors have given me uh, some treatment, but it's not efficient. I can prove it from the user data. Or on the other hand, they can say, it's very efficient. Look, I can prove it from user data. I mean, people uh, using this game and this uh, protocol are more supple, and they, they can uh, move uh, more easily. All right. So then there is another next step afterwards, <laughs> a bit more meta. We want to automate the process. We want to make it possible for everybody to uh, gather user data <coughs> and provide it on the internet. Uh, as open data. So that's what uh, JC, has, JC Himmelstein has uh, developed, and it's uh, Red Metrics. And it's open source, as you can see, you can fork it on Git GitHub. And it's ready to deploy, you just have to deploy in a, uh, on a server, and then, and then it, it just works. Okay, so just a wrap up of, of what you've seen. First, there were games, then there were user tracking, then there was crowdsourcing, then there was. <laughs> uh, user data for science, then crowdsourcing user data for science, and then automating the process. All right. And actually, I'm already done. I was so fast. Oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, maybe I can play again the game, or <laughs> I don't know, I can, I can show you uh, more things, and then, then we'll, uh, we'll go to yeah. questions. All right. So like, what I can show you is uh, the simulation part that uh, we've introduced in the game. Because it's been shown that it's, uh, it's more efficient for uh, a learning game to, to use simulators. OK, it's resizing all the time. 
So for instance, here I have my little bacterium that cannot move. I will give it something to move, so I create a genetic sequence. It seems complex because uh, the, it is a sandbox that, I sh that I'm showing you. It means that it's, uh, everything is available. So, of course, in the game you discover everything step by step. Here is everything sim simultaneously. So, here I'm searching for the sequence which makes which creates uh, a flagellum. Now I have it. My, my bacterium can move. Yes, I know I can divide. <laughs> and I can show you um, something that's very useful for uh, uh, geneticists. It's a sequence that makes bacteria appear green, bright green. It's a gene that's extracted from a jellyfish that transform blue light into green light. So here, the bacterium takes blue light and makes green light with it. And if you, if you think a bit, you can create more complex systems. Here it's just, uh, if there is blue light, then I create green light and uh, the genetic sequence is always active. But you can create uh, toggle switches, so that, like on-off buttons that are triggered by some uh, external event. So you can do that on a bacterium and say, if there is such a molecule, then uh, the bacterium will be in an on state and it will be blocked in this state, stuck in this state. And if another event happens, specific events, then switch to the off state. What I will show you is an even more complex system which is to make a bacterium blink. So if you put these four DNA sequences, okay, I first have to kind of kickstart it then the bacterium will blink. And uh, this is not faked. It's, it's, there is no system that says, if there are those four sequences, then it will <coughs> blink. No, no, there is a full, sim full simulator that computes uh, molecule concentrations. So that's what you see on the right side, molecules, molecule concentrations. And they interact with the DNA sequences and create these complex systems. And from that, you can imagine that you can integrate this game as, uh, as a practical uh, during a, a course in, uh, in genetics. Uh, instead of having uh, chapter 1 to study or exercise 1 through 12 to do for tomorrow, you can say, oh, uh, finish the first level of Hero Coli or uh, try to create something that makes the bacterium um, have a different amount of flagella. So here I'm I will create something that makes the number of flagella oscillate. So I can do this. I will have a bacterium that, that has a, an oscillating speed, you see, because it's creating flagella, destroying it, creating, etc., etc. So you can, you can from that uh, create exercises uh, for people. All right? I think I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? <coughs> yes? Do you consider porting it to an uh, open source game? So the question is, uh, am I uh, thinking about porting the game to an open source, open source engine? Uh, the thing is that I don't have much time. Uh, I'm, on a, I'm on my PhD year, last year, so I have to, uh, to make experiments. I don't have time. But if anybody is interested in porting it to an open source game engine, yes, definitely. The source code is already here. The thing is that it's in uh, C Sharp, and I don't think C Sharp is the uh, most optimized language for that. But uh, why not? Yes, I'm completely open to that, yes. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, the putting consideration is a real function or just a function? The genetic functions? No, so the, the putting put it. Uh, ah. This? Yes. The question is, uh, are the concentration kind of realistic? Yes. They are kind of realistic. Because... Uh, could it be systems or...? Yeah, yeah. I, I solve uh, differential equations. Okay. And uh, I use uh, DNA sequences that are extracted from uh, the internet, from the BioBrick Foundation that I showed you. So if I look at uh, some bricks, I can see that it comes from... Uh, Andy Lab, so uh, the lab of Drew Andy, or Jeff Pease from Stanford University. 
uh, and you see all all this like uh, um, uh, wavelength and uh, length in uh, base pairs. Everything is extracted from the internet. It's real data, but the, the simulator is a bit uh, simplified, so it's realistic to a certain point. For example, there is no uh, simulation of uh, glucose intake. You know, uh, here there is hundred. You have 100 energy, and it will uh, go to zero only if you put a lot of genetic uh, uh, sequences. It's not completely realistic. There should be something that computes metabolic pathways and stuff. But uh, I've asked specialists, and they told me, uh, you know, uh, specialists like those who created the whole cell simulator, they told me, no, it's, it's, you can't do that in real time. <laughs> because you have to uh, compute like a thousand genes simultaneously. And no, not yet. Yes? In which language can it be played? Uh, French and English. But uh, I'm searching for translators, so if you're interested to put it in Dutch, German, I don't know. What yeah. have you done to uh, facilitate translation? The question is, sorry, what? What have you done to facilitate translation? Into other languages? What have I done to facilitate the translation? Um, not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> now I've just I've created a, a Google spreadsheet, so it, it's, it's re I'm really at the um, phase of uh, thinking about making it uh, possible to translate it. I have not advertised the possibility of uh, translating no it. Uh, localization tool. No, there is no tool for translation. Uh, I know that there are open uh, open source tools, but uh, I've not spent time on this. Because uh, on Unity, there are uh, tools <coughs> to enable quick translations. And I, I didn't want to spend time on uh, trying to create a, a bridge between such a tool and uh, Unity tools. So I had to choose between uh, working on the simulator, working on uh, gamification, sort of, and uh, making a good translation system. But the Unity tools are there. Yeah, there are Unity tools to do that, yeah. But they are not open source. Yeah. Yes? Is the flagella um, so the question is, are the flagella uh, inserted when there is a sequence or if there is a uh, mechanism uh, on the level below that says there should be a flagellum? Um, the thing is that I compute a concentration of, uh, of a molecule that controls the growth of flagella. So it says if the concentration is above this threshold, then there is one flagellum, then two, then three, then four. Uh, but it's, it was really tailored to make it possible to play. This part is not realistic at all. Because otherwise, if I had made it really uh, realistic, the bacterium would, would go in uh, random directions, and uh, it would have random uh, concentrations of such molecules, so it, it would be unplayable. And that's why also the, the bacterium has eyes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know that there are some aspects that are, uh, <laughs> uh, and the, the bacterium does not look like that. It's supposed to be Escherichia coli, E. coli, but E. coli is more like a, a rice grain, a grain of rice, and it looks like a tadpole, like a, a small frog, you know. So yeah, we've met, we've made choices. <laughs> yeah. Another question? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you.